what's been happening? Yeah, well, um, we've made changes to the way we compile our our um, portfolios, haven't we? Well, I don't think we actually settled anything and we've been working our way through various options. I think we're getting closer to an answer. So I don't yeah. think we've changed. I think we've been on a, on a bit of a journey to come up with um, something that makes sense and can be repeated to deliver a consistent outcome. So I think we're still on that journey and I think we're getting closer. Yeah, because, I mean, previously, what was the, 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 the brick wall we were coming up with with regards compiling portfolios? Well, our approach, going back a couple of weeks, was to try and come up with a way of combining various uh, series of tests to come up with a, an optimum portfolio. Mm -hmm. And we thought at that stage the only way we could really do that was to try and iterate between all the various combinations. So if we started with, with uh, a number of possible scenarios, what's the best way of combining those scenarios to end up with a portfolio of maybe 20 or 50 combinations which could be fed into a portfolio. But the reality is when we when we went and did our, our data mining exercise, we ended up with a starting point of something like 20,000 possibilities. So to whittle it down from 20,000 down to 20 or 50 was an iteration process that uh, was just not feasible to be done. There's just too many combinations and it would take years and years and years to come up with any sort of half reasonable answer. So we, we ditched that and we've opted for another approach where we've still gone through the same data mining exercise. We've still got our 20,000 various combinations, but now instead of taking the view that we need to try every possible combination, we've decided to just randomly select out of that possible pool of 20,000, come up with a random selection of however many we're looking for. And right now we've, we've decided we want to find 20 20 combos that give us the best bang for our buck. And so we've, uh, we've ran randomly selected yep, 20, 20 combos for each instrument. Yep. Yeah, per instrument. So we're looking to see how we can combine <coughs> 20 of those 20,000 to come up with the, the best ma. And so our focus has been on finding a ma. And the, the way we do that is we grab the equity curve from each individual run. We record the monthly equity position of that run. And then because we've got uh, effectively 20 of those together, we can then sum the total variance month by month. So we end up with a, um, an equity curve that represents the total portfolio. And we can from that calculate what the MAR value for that is. And if we like that MAR, because it's the best MAR we've found so far, well, we hang on to that combination and then we put it back into the mill and we try again. Um, and we've managed to come up with a bit of software that allows us to do 5 million iterations of that. So although it's a random approach, we're randomizing it 5 million times and uh, watching the results topple out in terms of coming up with the best ma, it seems to stabilize at a combination that actually delivers a pretty good outcome. Now, it may not be the best outcome, but it's the best out of 5 million. And, yeah. Um, that therefore, that's what we're, we're currently looking at. And we've produced, we've produced that now. And we're looking now, Rich is working on ways of combining that to, uh, to give us across instruments now. Because up to this point, we've been doing instrument by instrument. We're now combining those instruments. And I think we're looking at a possible scenario at the moment of, of about 60 odd markets that we're looking at. So what's the best way of combining those 60 interest, uh, those 60 instruments streams, each of which has got 20 in it, coming together with a, um, a workable scenario. With, with the limitations of MT4, we're looking at probably coming up with 100, 100 EAs in total. So trying to figure out what the best way forward is. And um, haven't quite nailed that component of it yet, but we're getting close. I don't think it's going to be problematic. I think it's just going to be effectively an extension of the process we've currently undertaken. So at the moment, if you could imagine, Darren, we've got, say, 60 instruments, we've got 20 solutions for each instrument. So each instrument's solution um, in, in singularity produces the best MAR. So it's therefore 
not focusing on a single combo or a single range of variables. It's looking at a, a balanced range of variables that across the time series gives you that best ma. So it's basically compressing a range of different variations of the core strategy together to get that optimal relationship. Once we've got that at a single um, instrument level, we combine that into a, a single return stream, which is effectively 20 solutions that produces a single return stream. Then we um, have 60 of those single return streams. We do the same random um, process of compiling together, iterating to get maybe to a comfortable level of say 40 markets. Um, and those 40 markets <clears throat> would have an optimal MA relationship uh, at the portfolio level. So, and that would be basically going through a, a similar process across a common date range for all of them. And then once we've achieved that, then it's just a matter of scaling the portfolio and we're done. And at the result being that we'll have 40 separate EAs, each embedded within an EA, we'll have 20 solutions, um, which when applied um, to the to um, live trading, it gives you exactly what we want. We, we, we want a solution that basically attacks these major trends with almost like a machine gun approach um, where each, each we, we, we don't want to cluster around the same variable, if you understand what I mean. So when we yeah. say a machine gun approach, we know that there's a defined entry condition based on a donkey and brake that therefore enforces that we don't trade any trend. We're out in that outlier region. But when we do get into that outlier region, um, this machine gun will start and if it, the trend continues on, the machine gun continues. So it's a bit different to pyramiding on a single market condition because each of the um, components um, of that market, when they start firing away, are configured individually for their own type of um, trajectory outcome. You know, um, so but the effect of the machine gun is to give this big, broad, diverse range of different trajectories and collectively when they compile, I, I think we nail those outliers. Okay, and so just in, in, like, in layman's terms, uh, explain how, um, how this process gives us a robust solution because this is the bit I kind of struggle with understanding. Um, yeah. Where does the robustness of this approach come from? So there are three, basically three major areas the robustness comes from. The, the first one is the design itself. So the, the fundamental design of every single one of these strategies is based on cutting losses short, letting profits run. So <clears throat> it does that by having very limited number of variables to achieve that outcome. The first is an initial stop that cut losses short on entry. Um, right. That um, we've got a trailing stop condition, um, which is quite wide, gives a lot of breathing room. We have no profit target. So just that core fundamental design principle itself ensures that if you catch any form of extended directional movement, you will catch that that um, result. So we have a simple donkey and breakout system, which means that if we take a trade when that breakout occurs and the trade fails, if the price continues on in the trend um, to continue further, it takes another bite at it, another bite at it. So you will never miss the outlier, but you might be might, for instance, occasionally take a few attempts to get onto it because your, your trail might be too tight or your stop might be too tight. But um, so our fundamental design principle itself ensures that um, we will be able to catch a, capture a trend. Um, so that's not curve fitting at this stage because all we've done is we said this broad design feature is very simple and it must catch a trend if, if we get it. Then what we do is we say, right, now what is curve fitting? Well, curve fitting is an outcome from a data mining process where you don't basically have a logical design process in place first. You basically 
um, identify the indicators you want, the, uh, the broad number of indicators you want to use, targets, all of those things, initial stops, trailing stops, etc. Then the, 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 the factory data mines to create the design solution. We don't do that. What we say is the first step is create the design solution that we are happy with that ensures we catch that trend. So in this process, then what we say is, right, we're not actually data mining a design solution because we've already created one. But now let's apply this solution not to a single market because um, if it works well on that single market, that could just be a curve fit response for that single market. We want to apply it across the entire universe of 60 markets and determine the common variables that are applicable across the entire set of 60 markets. And this is this exercise we've done in the bias. So if you can imagine an outcome then where we get a, a narrow or range of variables that have been successful over the 60 markets in, in total uh, broad terms, uh, we restrict what we can actually um, optimise, or when I say optimise, what we actually select for is restricted from that range that is applicable across the entire set of 60 markets. Now, so this is where the, the next important thing comes. We treat each market as basically a data stream. Um, we normalise that market data by using an ATR normalisation method to basically <clears throat> adjust our return stream so that effectively what we're dealing with is 60 different um, possible market arrangements or market conditions that might be thrown at you across a 20 year period. So we're using a massive data set here. We're using 60 markets across 20 years of history each. And we're applying this very narrow range that's applicable to all across that entire series. So that outcome won't be curve fit because the, um, the sample size is huge. Yeah. So your ability to generate a random outcome within that context of a huge sample size is almost impossible. Um, so we know we're not curve fitting for the solutions that we then define the range that we look for. Then that goes to Fred and he puts it through this processing um, to we, we optimise within that, that range to come up with the best um, characteristics per market within the, the context of the, the, the entire market universe. And that then is used to develop these portfolios. And once they're developed, we then do a final test that it isn't curve fit by mapping the, um, the equity curve of that individual instrument against the market data itself. And so when you do that visual mapping process, you then confirm whether that logical design solution actually catches any outliers that exist in that market data series. And what we're finding is it's banging into them. Um, it's so each individual um, um, each individual return stream that is compiled in a single instrument, and we've got 20 of them, every single one of them maps to the market condition. <clears throat> and so it's not randomly um, being profitable because of, of you know how it's been constructed. It's actually doing what it's meant to do. So if the market trends with these anomalies, it's catching them, which is what we wanted with our original design outcome. So that final step is basically just a, a confirmation measure, just as a final thing to make sure it isn't curve fit and it's doing what it's meant to do. With returns, uh, performance, you know, what, what are we seeing? What are we expecting? Um, you know, what are the expectations in, in terms of performance? Um, it's it's exactly like, what you would expect. Like, if, if, for instance, you had the ability to look at a chart, say of Euro USD, yeah. and in hindsight say, as a trend follower, how would I have gone in trading this particular market? And when you look at that 20 year time series, you see that there was a wicked trending condition in 2014 that you'd have liked to have been on. Uh, that was, you know, a, a magnificent short move in 2014, where if you had any form of trend following system, you would have wanted to have been on that journey. 
and yeah. then the rest of the, the the market data is fairly noisy. There's a few little trends here and there, but nothing that you'd consider would be standout. Yeah. And so when you run these resultant um, solutions against that data, it's exactly what you get. You get this pretty ordinary stagnation effect on Euro USD for about 10 years. So it will between 2000 through to 2013, it was pretty ordinary. Um, there were some ups, some downs, but it wasn't deteriorating, which is a really good sign because what it's saying is the capital was being preserved during those less, you know, ordinary times where you wouldn't want to be trading. So it wasn't taking false breakout trades that the trade yeah. frequency was limited. We had a certainly had stagnating um, equity curve, but then like a rocket in 2014, up she goes, and it continues on until this current day because those trends that we caught in 2014, we're still riding them in a lot of our solutions. And the market generally is still being short from that period from 2014. So we had a magnificent um, profit outcome from a large number of our solutions, maybe 20 or 30, which was that initial strong drop um, in the Euro USD in 2014. But those solutions which had a very nice wide trail are still alive today and are, are benefiting still in that context with positive swap, um, which is another thing that we've looked for. We've, we've looked at the inherent characteristics of the instruments we've traded. And if there is a, a bias in that series from some beneficial factor, such as a positive swap rate, we take advantage of that. Any any little edge we can get to add to the overall edge of our portfolio. So, um, yeah, I, I I think we're onto something. Fred, what do you so, think? Yeah. So the thing, the point to note here is that while the euro gave us that one magnificent uplift in 2014, some of the other instruments that we've looked at have given us just as good a return, but at different time periods. So when you combine those together to get you a 40 odd instruments that you're trading, they're firing off at various random positions, which is what's giving us the big uplift in the in the overall portfolio. So um, it's important to note that we're not just dealing with one instrument, we're dealing with multiple instruments and combining those to give us the, the ultimate portfolio. If, if you could imagine uh, USD JPY actually had a magnificent uplift in 2013, not 2014. And that uplift has continued to today as well. So by adding those two instruments, we've got 2014 to current day covered and we've got 2013 to current day covered in a compiled solution. And now we're looking at 60 instruments. And when you look at where those outliers occur, the intent is there might be periods of stagnation. It might be periods of, you know, one year or two year. But the, the outlier impacts that we're actually going for are so significant to the PL, you just know comfortably and safely that you can hold these portfolios because they're not going to significantly deteriorate because they trade only when these significant events occur. So it's not as if we're going to have a rapidly deteriorating drawdown at all because we've managed that at all points in time. And we just lie and wait for these events that the market gives to us from time to time. And hey, presto. Yeah, and uh, you know, how how does this approach compare to other players in in this in this sphere, if you like, the other trend followers? I mean, um, are we doing I, anything distinctly? I yes, I know that they are. they tend to keep um, a lot of it under their hat, but yeah, I'd, I'd say we are in that we are much more restrictive in the trends we trade, so. I think a lot of other players are less prescriptive about the type of trends they'll jump onto, and they'll they'll jump onto um, a lot of different types of trend. We we are waiting for these extreme moves before we jump on board. So we're yeah. sacrificing the the immediate benefit of having something to trade and being patient and only trading during these more exotic times which it, the, there's two impacts that are created from that. The first is our trade frequency per solution is very low. It might be 12 to 14 trades over a 20 year period per solution. And remember, we've got 20 solutions in one um, instrument. So 
Um, across the portfolio of 60, though, it's 60 by 20 by 14. So our sample size goes up by virtue of a very diverse portfolio. But we would like to be more diverse. But what we're finding is a real restriction in the retail world that there's, um, there's, there's a limited product range to suit our style within this context of CFDs and Forex. So we do have to play within those limitations, which is a bit frustrating. But I think Fred and I would both say, gosh, if there was a bigger universe out there, we'd go for all of them. Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, yeah. So, I mean, we, <clears throat> we're we doing a, that kind of sitting on your hands thing much perhaps more than other trend followers. Yes. And the reason we do that is because we believe that there is a relationship between your trade frequency and your overall profitability. As you increase your trade frequency in a trend following context, we think your performance deteriorates. And that's because um, whilst you catch a far greater number of trends, um, in a lot of these efficient markets we're trading, there's a hell of a lot of noise and a hell of a lot of mean reversion. And that really means that the increased trade frequency basically means increased number of false breakouts, increased number of, of losses. And we, we when where we tend to predate is in that zone of extremity where our trade frequency is very low. So we keep the transaction costs very low and only strike when we think something is extreme. And we think actually that tilts the bias of the PL in our favor by virtue of the fact that on average, we, we, we get a very good reward to risk rate ratio, probably higher than a traditional trend follower would get um, because we're catching these big long running beasts with a wide variety of different trails. But um, I, we, uh, it's gonna be a fairly low win rate, but it's gonna be a very, very high reward to risk. Okay, and and so um, you know, how close are we to having some of these solutions um, available to to the members at ATS? We're progressing through uh, each of the markets. Uh, we've got, as has been pointed out, about sixty odd to go through. We've currently gone through about fifteen of those. Uh, oh. We're working through the rest. It's probably going to take us another week or so to get through uh, each of those. As you can imagine, there's a, each needs to go through this filter process and each needs to be sampled 50, uh, 5 million times. So it does take a little bit of time. Um, we've optimised how that's working and we are, we are making progress. But the really exciting thing is that when each of these pop out and we analyse what we're getting, um, the results are quite magnificent in terms of the uh, they're doing exactly what we want in that we're limiting the drawdown and we're picking up these uh, rewards yeah. when in fact the, the trend is there and looking at the the way the results map to the actual price structure it's actually quite phenomenal yeah I'm, I'm getting excited with that as well so Darren, just so you're aware and our, our, our forum members are aware, what this process that Fred is doing is effectively taking that process that previously we did visually and he's automating this process. Yeah. Um, so the good part about this is that we call ourselves um, systematic diversified trend followers. Now we've just got a, a, an extra 150% add-on with our systemization in that Previously, whilst we were systematic in our algo application in live trading, um, the process, the visual process of portfolio compilation, there was a bit of discretion applied there from me in the visual approach. But now Fred has got a solution which was almost complete, which totally removes any form of discretion and achieves what we think will be better than this visual approach, um, which is a really good outcome. And so if you could imagine, it's a bit like being presented with a a, a design, design for an EA um, that gets embedded into algorithmic code. Um, the testing is done over a broad universe without any hindsight selection of that universe. We determine a bias within that across all of the 60 instruments. No selection bias has occurred in that determination. Um, and then um, it goes into Fred's um, portfolio compilation process which is a fully automated thing where the PC chugs away in the background for a few days, 
getting these ultimate blends um, that um, at the end of the process, we've actually had very little discretionary input at all. And and we don't believe that there is any form of hindsight selection bias in it. Yeah, because as I understand it, you know, with the problem has always been that with a, a very simple system, when you run through all the possible variations of stop placement and trailing stop and look back period for the actual breakout, you, you're always going to get a huge number of possible systems that that are profitable over a long period of time. And then finding ways to combine those together in a portfolio and and have that portfolio be um, a good portfolio and have a huge number of possible systems, it's a huge amount of data, data isn't it? And and the actual process of, of generating the portfolio from that is is really complex. Well, that's, that's, where, that? that's where we've uh, we've taken that process, as you pointed out, which was pretty much what everyone does. They create an EA, they run it through their strategy tester, they try some of the various parameter sets to give um, various readings in terms of profit or return on equity or whatever their, their chosen return stream is. Um, and they're trying to make a selection from from that vast array. And the more parameters you got in there, the, the larger the the number of permutations is going to be. So you end up with more and more things to look through. What we've done is we've we've said we're going to take them all. We're not picking yeah. any of them out. All we're doing is we're going to take the whole run, the whole optimization run, which is why we've ended up in some instances with twenty thousand possible combinations. So we've we've taken those twenty thousand. That's everything that's run through, rather than try to pick one. We then do a, a very quick look to see which of these actually delivered a, a positive outcome at the end, and we're not interested in anything that doesn't give us positive expectancy. So we immediately cull out half of those, three quarters of those, twenty percent of those, depending on which uh, parameter sets we're using. And so what we're left with is is only profitable options. And then it's a question of trying those different options. And, and the trick here is not just looking at profit or profit factor. We're actually looking for Ma, and so if you're not familiar with Ma, is there's a there's a whole dissertation on that on the forum that the guys can look up. But in reality, it's it's a question. You know, the quick definition of Ma is uh, the return over the the period you're testing against the drawdown or the maximum drawdown in that in that cycle. So the better the Ma is, um, effectively that means you've either had the better profit or you've had a lower drawdown. And so by taking each of those individual runs that are all profitable, we then have obviously within that cycle, we have a number of different drawdown signatures. And so the first thing we do is we normalize all of those 20,000 to give us the same drawdown, which means we, we adjust the lot size to give us the same drawdown overall, which effectively means that the, the mark calculation in terms of relativity between the runs comes back to um, effectively what's the most profitable would give you the best mar but we're not looking for the best mar out of one run we're looking for the best combination of runs to give us the best overall mar which is why we then we then randomly choose 20 of those 2000 20,000 whatever we've got combine those on a month-by-month basis to figure out what the equity curve would have looked like and then what would that mar how would that mar have been generated what would have happened had we had that as our major combination and we do that five million times. And so at the end of that, we've got the best out of five million iterations, and that's the one we've settled on. And so far, we haven't been let down, and that uh, everyone that we've tested, once we've created our, our portfolio EA, because we take all of those 20 solutions, put it back into one EA, and throw that one EA back into MT4, and look at the equity curve it produces. And it, it hasn't let us down, and it's it's mapped to market very well. So we think we're on a winner there. Yeah, I've, I've seen some of the uh, results uh, that you guys have been posting up, and yeah, it's it's pretty exciting times. It's just such a a million miles away from from probably where we all started and what we considered trading to be. Um, but, yeah, yes. look, one of the things I'd like to add here is that 
we've got no idea whether these uh, whether we're going to be profitable in the future. We're actually not looking for that, because yeah. what determines our future profitability is whether the market has these outliers or not. If it doesn't have those outliers, we're not going to um, be be profitable for that particular market. But what we want to make sure, because we're using this MAR, which is a a risk adjusted metric. We want to ensure that if there are no outliers in that particular instrument, we want to preserve our capital. And so this solution we've got does that. It's looking at the risk adjusted performance to ensure that if there are no outliers for that particular market in the future, then we're, we're, we're just going to basically sit there with our capital with very little deterioration. Yeah. The drawdowns will not be ex ex extensive. So we are still dependent on classical trend following diversified principles in that we need a broad range of different markets because in some of those markets, there will be some outliers. But we just don't know when, where or, or which. Um, so we want a system that preserves our capital at all times, but we also want that confidence that when that outlier, if it occurs, we're onto it. Um, and I think that the processes we've taken in our structural design logic, the processes we're doing with, with, with avoiding any sort of form of this hindsight selection um, bias, I think the outcome is, is exactly what we're achieving. And so that's why we're getting a bit blown away at the moment because we're seeing how it mimics so it's catching these outliers that we wanted to catch and if there are no outliers well it just sits there spinning its wheels not doing much um which is great and that's what's making fred and i pretty excited about this process essentially as long as big trends happen in the future we we're going to be okay and that uh, that is from a, a a principle of design basically yes and even better still let's say we had another 2008 so what happened there is that um, in 2008, we didn't get just one outlier in one instrument. Um, the outliers sort of, there was a domino effect of these major outlier moves cascading across the different market sectors. And so with this solution we've got, if that event occurs again, it's not just going to be a single bonanza event. We're going to get it across 20, 30 markets. And that's where suddenly you know, kings are made, if you know what I mean. Um, and it's not going to be through any luck or, or you know, um, roulette spinning wheel or something. It's simply through a design principle that leaves us open to that possibility. Hey, Rich, why don't you uh, describe the Swissy trail that we did? Yes, so we, in the Swiss, um, we uh, our, our solutions were effectively long the Swiss because we were, looking at positive swap and over the time over the last few years at least quite a few years um, the Swiss has enjoyed pop positive swap with our particular broker Pepperstone and we were long in these positions before the DPEG um, when that DPEG occurred I think it was was it 2013 or 2014 somewhere around there uh, the Swiss DPEG um, yeah yeah. There was a massive move in the Swiss currency relative to the US currency. So we were trading the these um, USD um, CHF long. Yeah. Uh, we had this big drop and we noticed that in the unrealized equity curve. We saw that and we saw the impact. But because of our very wide cluster of solutions, some with very wide trails, um, we got through that with a bonus. Um, because it actually survived the the collapse without exiting some of our solutions and continued on to deliver the positive swap benefit over the next couple of years. So, so, so even if we're positioned wrong in these outlier moves, the damage is minimal. But if we're positioned correctly in the outlier moves, we make huge gains. Is that what you're saying? That's effectively what we're seeing. And if you can also imagine, um, because we're trading across 60 markets, um, our position sizing exposure when trading a diversified portfolio is relatively small per instrument. So, yes, we did observe this effect on Swissy, where we were positioned incorrectly with the collapse. But um, 
the risk mitigators of our system design started kicking in. Firstly, we had a, a low total exposure to USD Swiss by virtue of our wide diverse universe that we were trading. Um, secondly, because of our diverse array of wide trails, not all of them get triggered. Some of them did. Some of them we took a hit on, and you can see that in the in the curve. But yeah. the ones that were retained just rode through that spectacular event, and that was a major event. And we got through with flying colours where the equity curve lifted, uh, but over the course of two years beyond that event. It sounds to me that our approach here kind of aligns a lot with Taleb's um in Taleb's Black Swans where you know he says that it's it's really how you how you deal with these these sort of major outlier events that that's going to decide whether you survive or profit in the future so yes. it sounds like we're aligning a lot with his his um thesis sir Absolutely. And, you know, uh, I, I thought about this myself. And, you know, it, if we look at a complex system such as our financial system, or we look at a complex system such as our natural system or our environment, the world, you realise that the major changes aren't gradual in nature. The major changes occur through these exceptional changes, instantaneous changes. So, Change isn't a continual, gradual process. It, there are abrupt periods of time where change is significant. So when you look at evolution of the species, you start reading about Charles Darwin and then you start uh, getting involved with, um, you know, some of, some of the, the very notable people that have, um, you know, hypothesised what's going on and they talk about these extinction-level events which are the major causes of change and speciation. And, you know, we had the, the dinosaurs wiped out, uh, the, or the land-based dinosaurs effectively wiped out in a particular period of time, leaving this vacant possession for the, the mammals to start dominating. And that was a major speciation event where we suddenly got this explosion of different types of mammal species. And then a bit later on, there was another form of extinction level event um, uh, which suddenly causes speciation to change. So if you look at our evolutionary track record, you realise it's a punctuated equilibrium. It's not a gradual change. There are moments in time which are more important than others. And when you look at the financial markets, you start realising that long-term wealth is not a gradual thing. It occurs with these abrupt, non-linear um, outcomes, uh, mm -hmm. which which are a handful and you can't predict them. You never know what they are, but you've got to participate in them. And so when you look at then the most successful investors in the world, like Buffett, Soros, et cetera, they owe their complete fortunes to effectively maybe three or four outlier events over their entire life, which they would never have predicted, but they participated in. But that was yeah. actually the reason for their long-term wealth. Not, not that, it's not the small change. Um, that small change could lead you any path it might be random effectively over the course of many many events but it's these major outliers that i think that that's why we're focusing on these outliers is we 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 have a firm belief like taleb that it is the fat tails that basically dominate um a complex systems overall outcome or emergent outcome yeah and it's the polar opposite of generally what the retail trading world are trying to do they're trying to predict the every minute change in the in the system and and we we've gone to the to the, the, the extreme of our end haven't we we have because you know you know sometimes i question the fact whether even any form of prediction is actually something that we our, our brains want us to do but yes yeah it might be contrary to actually what you're trying to achieve. Um, yeah. I, I often question that, and I sometimes think that, you know, it's like coin flips. You can't avoid that there'll be successful people who've flipped a coin 200 times and been very successful, but it's not through any causative agent. It's through luck alone. And, yeah. but, but that the, the, the impression is that what you're doing is actually Causational, because you'd like to think that you're right for a reason, 
but it would be a nasty trick if you actually found that a complex system didn't act that way. And it would be a nasty trick as well if you suddenly realise that the complex systems are actually so complex that whilst we think we can get a handle on where price is going to be tomorrow or whatever, um, the reality is if I try and predict what's going to happen in two days or a week or whatever, um, yeah, that the sun might come up, it might be a warm day, but I might have a tsunami affecting me over that period that I would have never, ever considered. And that tsunami is actually the thing that would have influenced my life more than the sun rising or the warm day two days down the track. Um, it's these outlier impacts, unpredictable impacts that shape your destiny. Yeah, definitely. And I, I, th I think also it's, it's probably a much easier solution as well isn't it and, and we as human beings will kind of gravitate to you know when we're facing something that is really complex and difficult we'll try and find a way of, of avoiding that scenario i think that kind of drives us a lot as well to to kind of opt for the the seemingly uh, simple solution you know yeah exactly that brings us back to the um, the core principle we're adopting here, and that is the, the typical trend-following mantra, cut your losses short, let your profits run. So even in a random market, if you adopted that approach, you've got a better chance of making something out of it. Yep, because even a random market is going to randomly generate some outliers, which we, what we see when we generate random charts is you still get these kind of outlier or strong trend in uh um movements yeah definitely cool guys um it's been great catching up because I know i've been out of the loop a bit and you two have, have been crunching data like mad and um it's been great chatting to you today and look forward to our next podcast hope things get warmer over there mate sounds like <laughs> you're, you're a bit cold <laughs>